Today I want to talk about buying planes on eBay. I've mentioned it a couple of times in previous videos and I thought I'd uh, give you a few points as to what to look at um, uh, when you're looking through the listings. Um, buying a plane on eBay gives you an, an opportunity to get a, a plane which, which can potentially perform very well without going to great expense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, recommend that you buy sort of cheap budget planes like the current Irwin uh, record or the, the Stanley or Anand or Grotz or Faithful or anything like that uh, because they really aren't, aren't worth buying really. They're very difficult to get to perform terribly well. Um, I can remember a couple of years ago I was teaching a couple of weeks in, in, in Malawi and I couldn't take the tools out with me so I thought oh, I'll, I'll buy uh, a tool, some tools in the local township when I'm out there. And uh, the only tools that were available were Anand. Uh, the chisels were pretty rubbish and the plane was absolutely dire. Uh, I don't think the blade had actually been um, tempered so I was having to resharpen it every five minutes and then after a, a day or so a piece of the casting fell off the, uh, the frog. So certainly I, I wouldn't, wouldn't suggest that you, you go for any of those sort of down market planes like that. Um, I'm thinking specifically of record and Stanley planes here and uh, Preferably before mm, before the mid sixties is the best uh, in date, um, and some of the things I'll be showing you will give you an indication of, of what date is. Uh, so I've got here a plane in front of me, uh, which I've sort of cannibalised from various planes I've got lying around because I have got quite a few planes around. I'm, I'm the Imelda Marcos of planes here. Um, I must have bought over a hundred planes for my courses. Uh, over the years uh, for, for people to fetter on the courses and quite often people don't take their planes away with me so I've sort of accumulated a few and I've built up this sort of, um, sort of hybrid plane of, of, uh, to give an indication of all the things to look for and avoid when you're buying planes on eBay so if you avoid all these points then you should end up with a relatively a potentially good plane <coughs> first thing we can look at is the uh, the handles. Um, uh, the original um, Stanley and, and record planes had uh, rosewood handles, very nice, but uh, rosewood's become difficult to come by and become expensive. It's a sort of CITES band species now. Um, but way back, um, record and Stanley went over to beach instead, possibly back in the, I don't know, the 30s or sometime. Um, <clears throat> and then as sort of cost cutting became more prevalent, uh, uh, they then sort of started using um, uh, plastic handles. Certainly, uh, record went over plastic handles in the mid 60s, I think. And if we look at uh, this here, you can see not, not only is plastic a bit naff, it's not terribly nice to handle. Uh, I'd much prefer a sort of a wooden beach handle or something. But it also does crack very easily. So. Uh, you can see that's usually where they go down there on that uh, that bit there where it uh, meets the, uh, the retaining screw there, and it's very difficult to actually repair um, adequately um, broken plastic handle like that. So that's certainly something to avoid. Um, I've got another handle here somewhere. Yeah, I mean wooden handles do break as well, but they are repairable quite often. So here's one. You can see that crack down there. Um, and you can glue it back together again. It's not, that's not enough. It needs to have some reinforcement. Uh, so we'd put some sort of little dowel or something in there, which I will um, possibly do a video on uh, sometime in, in the future, how to repair a broken uh, um, plane handle. These are actually called the tote at this end. That's the knob there and the tote at this end. Um, Next thing to look at uh, is a sort of a bit of a dating thing and also a bit of a, uh, a quality thing as well. If I take this to bits, uh, we'll have a look at the adjusting mechanisms for um, adjusting the, the, the blade laterally and also the depth control. Now on this one, this is, uh, this is the uh, what not to buy plane. Can you see that this, the lever is actually um, pressed steel so it's sort of it's folded over there at the other end where the boss is that engages with the, the slot this slot in the blade this boss has just been pressed out um, 
And what tends to happen is it sort of gets bent back down again and the edges get worn because it's quite soft steel. Now, I suppose you could bend it back up again. Um, but th these wear this wearing here will get worse and worse until you can you, you move the lever like that and it doesn't actually make any difference. Um, <clears throat> so that's certainly something to avoid, this uh, pressed steel lever here. It's a definite no-no. Um, <clears throat> Another cost-cutting thing that came in sort of in the sort of late 70s um, is the, <coughs> uh, the yoke here became a two-part thing. So it's fabricated, it's made of two parts. It comes through to the top here and you can clearly see the uh, two parts of it there. And they're held together by a little rivet which is inside the pin, the pivot pin. And what happens is that rivet um, sort of wears out and you end up with these two parts splaying out so they don't actually engage with the, with the shoulders of the uh, adjusting uh, wheel here. So they, they splay out round it and you adjust it and they sort of, it doesn't move the blade. Now some people aren't bothered by that, they reckon you can glue that back together again but it's, it's a problem I'd rather not have really. Um, and on the earlier uh, planes, um, they had a, um, get that around so you can see it. <laughs> um, they had a, a, a cast yoke, so that is cast steel there. It comes up and it's a single piece there. Um, so there's not much chance of that um, uh, splaying out and, and deforming. Um, so if you can see it in the, in the pictures on the, on the eBay listing, uh, if you've got a choice between one with a split yoke and one with a cast yoke, I'd suggest you go for the, uh, the cast yoke one. It's not a breaker, but um, it's sort of, if you've got two planes and you're choosing between the two, it's, it's, it's an issue you could think about. Um, while well, we've got the, uh, the frogs out like this, another thing you can consider if, if, the, if there is a picture of this, this area is um, on the later... Um, planes, the casting was recessed out like this, so you can see how there's these lower areas here, the blue bits, um, and that meant that you only, the machining only had to be on those sort of raised surfaces, you didn't have to machine the whole surface, and on the earlier planes, before about 1960 or so, they had a bigger area to machine, which meant the production costs were higher. Now again, that's not a it's not a deal breaker really, uh, you know, um, you could probably get a, a good, good, um, you know, good performance out of a plane with that sort of pattern, but just somehow I feel, feel happier to have a, a plane where the, the blade is sitting on a, on a big flat surface like that, rather than that recessed out surface. <coughs> and one other thing about the frog we could have a quick look at uh, while we're here is uh, if we turn the frogs over you can see that there's a slight difference in the the way they get them in the right place uh, a slight difference in the, in the um, adjustment mechanism for the sort of position whoops the front to back position of the frog uh, if you look on this one this is the uh, the later one the what not to buy plane um, there's just a, a uh, slot been. There you go. There's a slot been milled out of the, uh, the, the the casing there. Whereas on this one, it's a, a U-shaped plate that's screwed on like that. And what I find is that the uh, and also the slot engages with a a flange on the uh, adjustment screw there. Get it in the right place. Where is it? Here we go. So there's a little flange on that adjustment screw, and when you, when you put the two together, uh, there's a lot of play there. It's not terribly satisfactory. Whereas on, um, on this one, when you put the frog in, there's quite a positive, there's no movement there. It's quite a positive seating there. Having looked at the um, the frog and the yoga things, let's now have a little look at um, the blade. Um, so this is the blade out of the, uh, the what not to buy plane. If we take the cap iron off, if you 
look at that. Can you see it's quite short that? Um, it's, I measured it earlier, it's about 20 uh, millimetres from, from there to the, the actual cutout there. Um, <clears throat> three quarters of an inch. But that's not, not, not the end of the story really, because if you look, um, you can see there's an area, sort of a, a shinier, brighter area there, and then it becomes all matte, and there's a sort of boundary between the two. That brighter area is, is, is where the steel's been tempered, whereas back here, um, this is just sort of the mild steel, it's a lot softer. Um, so the actual cutting edge only extends to about there, back here, you wouldn't, you know, the plane, the blade becomes useless. So the actual working life of this blade is fairly limited. So if you can see the um, the blade in the in the in, in the listing pictures, then if you've got a very short blade like that, it's probably getting towards the end of its life. It's not the end of the world. You can buy a new blade from uh, a new Stanley blade, which will fit any a record or a Stanley plane. Uh, it's only about ten pounds. Um, but um, it's worth considering it when you're looking at the listings. The other thing you can, uh, you can look at, which I'm not sure whether it would be terribly clear. Actually, let's, let's have a look at that. Can you, can see, you can see how the difference, I mean, this has probably been sharpened a few times as well, but you can see the difference in length between the blades. I've also got a new one out, so you can see how, how much longer the new ones are. Um, but uh, the other thing you can consider, if you can see any any uh, printing on the on the blade when you see the photographs on the listing. Um, let's get this one out as well. Um, it can give you an indication of what the steel is that the uh, blade's made of. Um, on Stanley blades, it's uh, fairly simple. It just says Stanley made in England. And Pat Stanley thought that made in England was good enough recommendation. On record planes, um, they're a bit more specific. So on this one, it's saying genuine record, tungsten vanadium steel. And that tells me that it's a slightly later um, uh, blade than this one, which is, says uh, record made in England, best crucible cast tungsten steel. So that's a slightly earlier blade than this one. Those are pretty good, but um, one thing about these um, best crucible ones is I'm probably not going to be able to see this but I'm just going to take my word for it but um, if we look at the where the uh, bevel's been ground you can see a slight change in the texture of the grinding um, with a boundary sort of part way down that's indicating this is a laminated blade um, so underneath we've got the hard um, tungsten steel and then above we've got milder steel um, which is softer so it's easier to grind and sharpen um, so we've got the best of both worlds we've got the nice hard steel underneath and then the softer steel above so that we, it take, doesn't take so long to, to, to grind the to grind the edge as if we had if we had hard steel tungsten steel all the way through these uh, um, the tungsten vanadium aren't laminated, um, so they're sort of, um, they take a bit longer to, to grind. Um, while, I've, while I've got this blade out, I just wanted to show you um, uh, this, this little extra thing. Sometimes you get uh, stay set planes come up on eBay. So this is stay set. This is the, the, the um, cap irons in two parts, so you've got that bit and you've got this little bit that uh, comes away. And the idea is, it's called a stay set, is that you should be able to sharpen the blade without having to take the cap iron off. Um, the other advantage of it is, it's a very chunky piece of, uh, piece of metal, this stay set cap iron. So it's a lot more rigid than the, the sort of other thin uh, cap irons, that, uh, the standard cap irons. Um, so that helps to hold the blade uh, more rigid. And as I said, uh, in, when I was talking about planes in the previous video, any flexing or movement or vibration will affect the quality of the cut. So the idea is that the, uh, the stay set cap iron gives you a, a 
uh, should give you a better cut because it's more rigid. And usually, it's back in the plane. You can tell a stay set plane, or when record produced the planes, they put an SS on the on the cap iron there. You see, there's an SS stamped on the on the on the iron. Um, so, if you see one with an SS on it, it's possibly you know the stay set cap iron might have gone missing, but it's, the chances are it will have a stay set cap iron. They usually go for a little bit of a premium on on, e, on eBay, although I did pick up this one before Christmas, um, uh, and it was sort of only about forty pounds. Um, <clears throat> the one of the most important things. I forget, let's see this one. <clears throat> one of the most important things to, to look at um, is the sole. Um, <clears throat> Um, specifically, are there any cracks in the sole? And usually, cracks will 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 appear if there are any um, in the corners of the mouth. Uh, so, if we look at this one, you can see there's a little crack down there. Uh, that side's okay, but this side's got a little crack in it. And usually, what's happened is the plane's been dropped, and the blade and the frog assembly has been pressed down and been forced into that opening there and, and, and cracked it. Uh, now that makes it very difficult to flatten that plane and also you probably get movement uh, over, over a period. It might even, even The crack might even get a bit bigger. So uh, any, any um, planes with cracks in the soles, it's probably worth avoiding them. And if there's not a picture of the sole on the listing, I'd suggest you actually contact the seller. If, you, if you're really interested in the plane otherwise, contact the seller and say, are there any cracks in the sole? And if they say they're not, and it turns up and it has got cracks, and uh, um, you've got got an issue with the seller. Uh, I have got a plane here, which I just keep around the workshop, just to sh remind me what an idiot I am sometimes. Uh, and <laughs> that's this one here. I bought this one on, e on eBay a few years ago, and can you see there's two cracks? There's two quite big cracks either side there. I actually started flattening it before I spotted the cracks were there. That's why we've got these two abraded surfaces here and a little bit along here. And then I thought, well, that looks a bit strange. Then I spotted these cracks. Um, so I bought myself a turkey there and uh, uh, I live to regret it. And I remind myself occasionally uh, that that's what I do. Um, one thing, I've, this isn't really to do with uh, helping you to buy the good planes on eBay, it's just a little rant about uh, eBay sellers. They do insist on um, tarting up the planes. One of the things I like about using an old plane is, is to feel that I'm actually using a plane that many craftsmen have used before me, and I'm sort of in a, a line of craftsmen. Um, what eBay sellers tend to do, or quite often they'll do, is strip the plane down, and refinish the, the, the sole, you know, repaint it and everything, and, and strip all the finish and the, uh, knock off the handles and things, and, and re-oil them, and just completely take the character away from the, the plane, you know, strip off the patina of the craftsman that came before. And I really can't actually understand what's, what's in it for them, really, because you're only going to get about 35 quid for the plane, and it's going to take, take you a bit to sort of strip it all down and... and uh, and get the old paint off and repaint it and re-oil it and everything. So my advice is don't bother. <laughs> Let the person who buys it do with it as they want rather than uh, um, tarting it up for sale. Um, rant over. Uh, one last thing, it's a little eccentricity which I bought um, uh, a, few, a few, well, quite a while ago now actually. Uh, which is this, um, just to get yourself organised. Um, I bought this as a, as a number five, five and a half plane, this one here. I bought this as a five and a half plane, and um, it's, it's okay, it's, you know, it needs, needs a bit of tarting up, so <laughs> it didn't get tarted up by the seller. Um, so, five and a half, put this one next to it, and it's a perfect match. But then I started looking at it, uh, no, I notice it says number seven there, and there's just the vestiges of the word record there. Um, so I got my number seven out and put it next to it. 
and I realised what they've done is someone has cut off the, the, the two ends of the plane to make a number five and a half out of a number seven. Um, so it's had quite an intricate history, this, this plane. It's, it's been done really well, you know, it's, it's beautifully um, finished off on the cut, you know, the actual curves of the, of the end is a, a perfect match. Um, so it's had a bit of a checkered history actually, because although it's a record plane, it, actually, it has actually got a, a Stanley lever iron on it, and also a Stanley blade. Um, but we're probably going to be fettling this up on the next um, uh, beginners or, or uh, plane um, tool sharpening course. Uh, we'll see what it turns out like. There's, there's a bit of rust on the underneath, but I'm not too concerned about that. Anyway, that's about it. I hope that's helped you with your uh, eBaying activities. Um, if you can be bothered, it would be great if you could uh, subscribe to the channel. But otherwise, if you have been, thanks for watching.